Good evening. Um, they have opened up the upper balcony for those of you just coming in. Uh, feel free to fill in up there. It's going to be a very visual show, and it'll be great seats up there. So please enjoy. Um, tonight's, uh, as many of you know, uh, we start these talks often with a short film that somehow exemplifies long-term thinking uh, along the theme of the evening's talk. And actually, uh, for tonight, uh, the long short was selected by our speaker, Nikki Case. Please enjoy. Pace is everything. Um, the physicist David Deutsch claims that science basically advances from explanation to explanation to explanation, and civilization, in a sense, follows the same track. The other side of an explanation is understanding. And one of the synonyms for saying I understand is I see. Someone who's exceptionally good at seeing is our speaker, Nikki Case. So, you may remember playing this game as a kid, Monopoly, or what it should be called, the game that ends friendships and destroys families. <laughs> 
So yeah, most of us remember suffering through this excruciating experience. But what you may not know is that Monopoly was based off another earlier, and in my opinion, better game. Monopoly has a secret history. So in the year 0866, Elizabeth McGee was born, the daughter of an abolitionist who traveled around with Abraham Lincoln. And when she was young, uh, her father introduced her to the economic philosophy of Henry George, who saw the monopolies of their time as a problem and advocated a unique solution that would keep the free market system's innovation, but not its inequalities. And Lizzie was enthralled. When she was 37, uh, she created a board game that took the complex systems of George's economic philosophy and explained them in a visual, tangible, and playful way. She called her game the Landlord's Game. <laughs> it came out 30 years before Monopoly, and it played like a slimmer, less soul-crushing version of Monopoly. <laughs> but here's the strangest thing. Lizzie intentionally designed her game to be broken. It worked like this. If you play Monopoly, you already know what happens. Players go around the board, buying property, collecting rent from their property, but this creates a vicious cycle <laughs> where someone gets a very small edge at the start, and it's already guaranteed they're going to be the winner in 15 minutes, so everyone has to wait for like four hours for this sweet release of death. <laughs> and that was Lizzie's point that this economic system of land rent was terrible. It is a broken game. But Lizzie didn't want to just show a systemic problem. She wanted to show a systemic solution. So she later made an add-on to her game, and altogether she called them the landlord's game and prosperity. So it worked like this. After everyone played the landlord's game and was incredibly ticked off by it, uh, they would then switch over to prosperity. Uh, and so prosperity has the same rules as the landlord's game, but with one change. Instead of paying the full rent to the landlord, part of the rent uh, would be paid to the middle of the board, the, some communal fund. And those funds in the middle of the board would be used to buy back the monopolies that happened during the landlord's game. So first they will buy back the utilities, and then buy back the railroads, and then finally, if there's excess uh, funds in the middle, they'll use it to create a universal basic income. <laughs> Which is actually what the go mechanism in Monopoly is supposed to be. You go around the board, you go past go, and you get your basic income. That was actually that. <laughs> and according to Lizzie's interpretation of George's economics, uh, with this one change and this one rule, what was once a vicious cycle has now become a virtuous cycle. <laughs> and everyone enjoys prosperity. Anyway, then some guy stole her design, turned it into crap, and sold it off to Parker Brothers, and they all live happily ever after. <laughs> but anyway, this talk is not about some obscure 19th century economic philosophy that may or may not work. So why did I bring up the story of Elizabeth McGee? Well, one, we live in the post-TED Talk world, so I need to always start with a talk of a story. <laughs> and two, because Lizzie's creation is my personal favorite example of seeing whole systems. That's the title of the talk. <laughs> Hi, I'm Nikki Case, and I explain complex systems in a visual, tangible, and playful way. I've made games and simulations about social trust, environmental economics, mental health, political polarization, alternative voting systems, and fireflies, because fireflies are awesome. <laughs> And since you're here listening to this long now talk, you probably have a goal. You want to slay a dragon. We all care about some big problem. Global warming, terrorism, pandemics, poverty, crime, war, you know, the usual. And these big problems are not the dragon. The dragon is the set of systems that, come, that create these problems. The dragon is complexity. The dragon is chaos. Now, you may be thinking, what? Am I saying that a bunch of board games and stick figures will help save the world? And I'm saying is, yeah, sure, why not? <laughs> because there's three reasons why it's important to not just abstractly understand or describe these whole systems, but to really see these whole systems. And the first reason is to make the abstract concrete. 
Because scientific progress is not made by scientists floating up in abstract land and going higher and higher into abstract world. No, it's made when we bring these abstract ideas down to our level, where we can see it with our monkey eyes, feel it with our monkey fingers. A lot of people think that visualization is just eye candy. It's just a way to gift wrap ideas and deliver it to the masses. Real scientists can work in just purely abstractions, right? Well, consider the following. In the 1940s, French mathematician Jacques Hadamar surveyed 100 of the top physicists and mathematicians of his time. And he asked them, how do you do your thing? How do you think? And it turns out that only very, very few of them actually think in mathematical symbols or use them in their day-to-day -day, uh, imagination and work, while all of them reported seeing what their theories, seeing their work. And actually, a full third of them uh, actually felt their ideas and theories in their hands, in their muscles, including Albert Einstein. Uh, this is one of the very rare Einstein quotes that's actually an Einstein quote. <laughs> and it goes like this. The words of the language do not seem to play any role in my mechanism of thought. Thoughts are, in my case, of a visual and muscular type. Yeah. So no, uh, real scientists don't just float up in abstract land. They bring it down to the human level. And so, yes, visualization can help us organize our thoughts within ourselves, but they also help us <coughs> communicate thoughts. So number two is to foster communication. Because if we want to tackle the big problems, we have to tackle it together. Different people, different fields need to communicate with, all, with one, one another. However, when it comes to communication, words are terrible. As someone who's using words right now, I can assure you they are pretty terrible. <laughs> so uh, actually, when I was uh, flying in a couple days ago from Canada, uh, the border guard asked me, oh, so what are you coming here for? And I said, I'm giving a talk. And he said, oh, what about? And I said, visualizing systems. So what does that mean? I have no idea. Because, <laughs> yeah, system, the word system itself is the most vague and, frankly, useless word out there. I mean, there's probably vaguer and more useless words, but anyway, system. I, and on the other hand, I could use more technical and precise jargon like nonlinear dynamics, self-organization theory. Uh, but that would be... One, jargon makes it harder not just to talk with the public and policymakers who we will need for solving these big problems, but jargon also makes it hard to talk to someone who's outside of your field or even outside of your own subfield. However, I think talking in pictures gets you the best of both worlds because pictures are specific, unlike a word like system, but they're also universal, unlike nonlinear dynamical blah, blah, blah. <laughs> So you need both pictures and words. You need to both show and tell. So once everyone's using visualization to see their own thoughts and to show their own thoughts to others, well, what's all that for? Well, number three, visualizations can help to guide us on our course. A visualization is kind of like a map. And, uh, you know, so maps have three purposes. One, they show what we do know. They show what we don't yet know. But most importantly, they guide us through a complex and unknown uh, territory. And now you may be thinking, well, we can't possibly map a whole system. Seeing whole systems, you can't do that. And you're right, actually. So I don't know why I gave this talk. <laughs> no, 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 you're right. You cannot see whole systems, and you shouldn't. Here's what happens when you try to map a whole system. This is an actual slide from a military presentation given a few years ago. <laughs> it's about the war in Afghanistan. And one of the generals said, when, one, when the slide came up, one of the generals said, once we understand this slide, we'll have won the war. <laughs> As you may have inferred, we did not in understand the slide. <laughs> Which is the point. This is a bad map, because even though it's incredibly detailed, it doesn't give guidance. To give like a complete opposite example, let's contrast this to this map of where we are right now in San Francisco. This map 
is obviously wrong. Roads are not white and yellow. Words aren't floating in the air. Buildings are not gray, featureless blocks. And if there was a giant red guitar pick floating above us right now, I think we would have noticed that by now. But even though it has all the details wrong, it's incredibly useful. Because, yeah, we all know that every map is simplified, but few people understand that. Maps are not useful despite being simplified. They're useful precisely because they're simplified. So that's why, in this talk, I want to give you the tools, the, the three simple tools, to let you see and play with systems. I want you, after this talk or tomorrow, to be able to pick up a pen, get a scrap of paper, I didn't bring the paper, and draw the systems in your own field or the big problems you care about. So that's the reveal, why this isn't just a gimmick, that's why I hand drew all 200 of my slides, which took forever. That, that, that dragon took me two hours. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> but yeah, these tools that you can do and see and play with of your own with drawing, these tools are concrete, they help you communicate, and they'll help guide humanity on our course. And as we set sail on our course to unknown worlds, we best heed the advice of ancient maps. Here be dragons. So once upon a time, and yeah, I'm doing the whole start of a story thing again. Once upon a time, the British colonialists in India had a problem, snack. <laughs> Specifically, venomous cobras. Now, the Indian population was you know, used to these uh, venomous creatures, but the British colonialists were pretty terrified and wanted to fix this problem. So they put up a bounty. For every dead cobra you bring in, good sir, you could get some cash. And for a while, this seemed to work. Um, people were bringing in dead cobras. Too bad the population wasn't actually going down. Because that's when the British realized uh, the population was not going down, even though they were getting all these dead cobras, because it turned out some smart, enterprising people were actually farming. Uh, <laughs> these cobras, knowing that they could make pretty good money doing so. Once the British found out that, oh crap, we didn't know these savages would actually be intelligent human beings like the rest of us, they, they canceled their bounty, and which meant there was no longer a financial incentive to keep the cobras around, so they just let them all go. Now, a disclosure, this story is apocryphal, so, but one, this isn't exactly the only example of the British Empire messing up India. <laughs> and two, the bigger point of this story is, whenever we try to slay the dragon of complexity, it turns out it's not just a dragon, not just any dragon, it's a hydra. You chop one head off and two more grow in its place. Too many drunk people, let's prohibit alcohol. Oh no, now gangsters like Al Capone exist. Too much disease, let's put antibiotics in all our livestock. Oh no, now antibiotic resistant superbugs exist. I think the reason why we get so many hydra problems is because we tend to think that cause and effect is linear. A causes B, B causes C, and so on. And if you were more sophisticated, you might say that, oh, multiple causes for one thing, and one thing has multiple effects. But that's still like lines. It's still lines of causality. It's still linear. But the thing is, the world is not linear. It's loopy. A thing can be its own cause or effect later in time. It feeds back onto itself. That's why it's called a feedback loop. But now, how do we see and play with these feedback loops? Well, pretty simple. You get a piece of paper. And you get yourself a pen. This one's Prisma, whatever. I'm not going to do product placement. Um, <laughs> first, you draw a bunch of circles for whatever things you want to represent, like, say, a simple ecosystem, hairs and lynxes. Uh, then you draw the relationship between these things. Uh, so for example, here I've drawn an arrow with a plus sign from hairs to lynxes, because uh, more hairs means more lynxes, because hairs feed lynxes. 
with their bodies. <laughs> and to complete the loop, uh, lynxes, from lynxes to hares, I have a minus sign with the arrow, uh, because more lynxes means fewer hares. Lynxes eat hares. And then you can extend this to as much as you want to map out your system. Just don't, don't go as far as, this, as, as the Afghanistan guy. Just keep it, keep it simple. <laughs> Oh, by the way, if you want to draw your own systems and actually see it play out in the simulation, uh, a few months ago, I made a tool called Loopy, a tool for thinking in systems, seeing and playing with whole systems. And people have been really great. Uh, the users have mapped out all kinds of systems, media economics, mental health, gene regulation, you name it. Uh, I just wanted to share this tool because, one, I feel like it might be actually useful for you in your own day-to-day uh, -day life or at least in your own work in mapping systems. And also, too, I want to prove that I can actually do more than draw stick figures. So putting up a simulation. Anyway, so that's how you draw loops. But how do these loops behave? There are three kinds of feedback loops. They are, one, the reinforcing loop. This is when something accelerates itself. Uh, an environmental example, um, heat makes the ice caps melt, which means more dark ocean water, which traps more heat, which means even more ice melts, so on. Oh, by the way, this is sometimes called the positive feedback loop, but I feel that's really misleading. You know, words are terrible, uh, because they think, oh, positive, it's really nice, but then the ice caps melt, and it's like, oh, that's, that was not positive at all. <laughs> so that's why a reinforcing loop. Kind of imagine, say, a ball on a hill. You push the ball just a little bit, and then it starts accelerating and accelerating down the hill. And this kind of feedback loops, whoops, this kind of feedback loop generates exponential growth and dramatic decline. But now there's also the opposite kind of loop. So number two, balancing loops. This is when something undoes itself, and economics is full of these kind of examples. Um, say there's a suddenly a shortage of something, so the supply drops, but Lower supply means that prices go up. Prices go up means that there's a higher profit incentive. Higher profit incentive means that producers create more supply. And so it undoes itself. Um, and this is also sometimes called the negative feedback loop, but that's, again, misleading because uh, your body is full of negative feedback loops to keep you alive, so it's not really that negative. <laughs> and again, you can visualize this as a ball in a valley. Even if you give it a large shove, it will move back to its roll back to its original place eventually. And this kind of loop cr tends to create graphs like this. Um, things that go to equilibrium or oscillate around a point, or some mix in between where it oscillates and then dampens and then goes to equilibrium. But now here's our most bizarre kind of feedback loop. Number three, chaos. And this isn't actually a loop, but it's a reason why loopy systems are so unpredictable. I, I want to give a concrete physical example. Let's consider two pendulums swinging side by side. They don't interact with each other, so right now it's pretty predictable. But if you were to put a pendulum at the end of another pendulum so that there's a feedback loop between the two pendulums, you get chaos. You get like one of those robot arms from that short video earlier. <laughs> and it's not just that this is like really hard to predict. Like, no, it's been mathematically proven uh, in chaos theory that the smallest amount of error makes it completely impossible to predict. So, and this is, no, we're not even talking about the climate or the economy or foreign policy. This is a pendulum. It's two pendulums. <laughs> so, so what can we do with these real-world systems? So the moral of this story is that prediction is for chumps. <laughs> but what does that mean? Should, does that mean we should give up? No. Think about, say, a pinball game. It's a totally chaotic system. You can't predict it even one second in advance. But that doesn't mean you can't have better or worse players. In fact, to become a better player, what you have to do is create a tighter feedback loop to quickly see what's happening in the machine and quickly play with what's happening. Well, we'll play with the machine. Visual input, tangible output. See and play. 
These are the three tools that help us map systems, reinforcing loops, balancing loops, chaos. But if these tools can't predict our course, how can they guide our course? Well, these tools provide a very strong piece of guidance, which is this. Fight loops with loops. Concrete example. Think about a simple thermostat. None of that fancy Nest stuff. Just good old, honest thermostat. <laughs> like, you know, a thermostat doesn't use the Navier-Stokes fluid equations to simulate and predict the thermodynamics in your house. No, it's just a simple balancing loop. If it gets too cold, turn up the heat. Uh, if it gets too hot, turn off the heat. Uh, and it's, yeah, imagine a ball in the valley. It just keeps it at an equilibrium. It, the thermostat doesn't predict the future. It doesn't even remember the past. And yet, this humble thermostat can keep you nice and cozy during a winter day. <laughs> and that's how we should approach complex systems. Not by trying to predict whatever in the future, because prediction is for chumps, but by changing the loops, fight loops with loops. We can create reinforcing loops to increase the things we value, and create balancing loops to maintain the things we value. Just like how Elizabeth McGee showed that with one simple change, we can transform a vicious cycle into a virtuous cycle, maybe with one simple change in how we see and understand systems, we can outsmart the Hydra. So right now, I live in Boston. Um, they're on the East Coast. Many of my friends there who have been there for a while, uh, they have a story. They all remember the day that, keep your eye on the arrow, they all remember the day that this happened. <laughs> on August 14, 2003, several states in the American Northeast and Midwest, and part of Canada, um, experienced what was then the second biggest blackout of all time in the world. 55 million people lost power. Some of them lost power for up to a week. And what could cause so much chaos? Given that no foreign power has ever taken down America's electric grid, especially on this scale, who was this master criminal who, dis who successfully launched an attack on our own infrastructure? The culprit was a tree. <laughs> <laughs> it was a nice summer day. So people turned on their air conditioning, which heated up the wires. And because metal expands when it's heated, that caused the wires to sag. And it sagged enough that a tree in Ohio could reach to that wire and set it all on fire. <laughs> which is OK. This is actually normal. This happens all the time. But I mean, the trees probably don't scream when it happens, but you know, it happens all the time. And this would usually only result in one station, one power station being knocked out. But due to a software bug, uh, they couldn't send an automated alert to its neighboring power stations. So it took its uh, electric load and it passed it off to its neighboring power stations, which caused them to overload. So they passed their load on to their neighbors, which caused them to overload, which created a vicious cycle that swept throughout the entire Northeast causing a blackout. <laughs> this isn't the only example of something bad cascading throughout an entire network. For example, the 2008 financial crisis. A handful of banks in the US made some bad bets. Then something happens, and then Greece burns. <laughs> That's because we're living in such a connected economy, for better and for worse. Or think about epidemics. One patient, zero. A little bit while later, millions die. That's because we're all really connected, again, for better or for worse. And underlying all these systems is something called attractors. They're called attractors because they attract the system towards different things. Uh, in this case, they all attract the system towards failure. And I think the best way to understand attractors is, if you can guess, to see them. So imagine you have a ball on an oddly shaped hill. And let's say that the left-right position represents um, you know, how good or bad something is. So if the ball's way on the left, 
Okay? Um, that's good. That means none of the power stations have failed and all the banks are still alive. But if the ball is all the way to the right, uh, that means power stations have all failed, the banks are all bankrupt. I uh, also want to clarify that the up-down um, axis is not good or bad. It's stable or unstable. So if something is really, if a ball is really high up in the air, it's pretty unstable. But if it's down, grounded, close to the earth, it's pretty stable. And now stable and unstable, again, words are terrible. Um, they have positive and negative connotations. But here's the thing. Here we have a good but unstable situation and also a bad but very stable situation. And these mountains are what we saw earlier, uh, reinforcing loops, a ball on a hill. So for example, um, you know, one reinforcing loop in the power station example is power station fails, it cascades onto the next ones, or a bank fails and that cascades onto the next banks. It keeps the ball rolling. And the valleys, those correspond to balancing loops. Um, ball in the valley. Um, for example, for the power station example, you know, eventually you run out of power stations to make fail, and for banks, eventually you run out of banks to make bankrupt. So the ball stops at the bottom of that valley. And these valleys are the attractors, because they attract the ball to a certain point. In this case, failure. So now you imagine you are standing next to this ball, and you're a complete jerk, so you push it a little bit. <laughs> And with a little small nudge, it gets past the tipping point, and then gravity takes over. The ball will quickly roll down the reinforcing loop, the mountain, and into the balancing loop, the valley, the attractor, the valley of death. And furthermore, you can see that if you were to go down and actually be nice for once and try to undo all your damage, it would take you a lot more effort than what it took you to push the ball in the first place all the way down. That's why a blackout can cascade in a few hours, but fixing it took weeks. Or why the recession can spread around the globe in a few months, but fixing it took, well, we're still living through the consequences. Sometimes you have the opposite problem. Instead of one bad thing cascading throughout the entire network, the entire network has already failed, and you're trying to fix it, but as soon as you try to fix one part, the rest of the system conspires against you to try to make your part fail again. In systems thinking jargon, this is called an intractable problem. Um, but we can also understand this visually as well. Just flip everything around. So now we have you know, the same hill as before, but flipped around left to right. And let's have the bad thing on the left and the good thing on the right now. So let's use an example from peace building. Uh, left is war, right is peace. So you are a peace builder. You want to put in a lot of effort it's going to take a large amount of blood, sweat, and toil to get that ball up to the small little peace valley up there. It takes a lot of effort to create a ceasefire, to push forward a peace agreement, to build a whole new democratic government. But the problem is, even if you succeed, all it takes is a little bit of chaos, and all your hard work has been undone. <laughs> and I mean, recent history has given us a lot of examples of a new peace deal or a new democratic government collapsing back into chaos, tragically, that, because that is an attractor of doom. You can also visualize this through uh, simulations. So here's one simulation that I made in Emoji. Hopefully it's better than the Emoji movie. Um, <laughs> so yeah, you can visualize cascade failures through play. So here's a simulation I made of an epidemic. Uh, so these are healthy people, but with one little small push of chaos, the ball keeps rolling, it infects people, it kills people, and everyone dies. <laughs> well, almost everyone, those half of them are okay. Yeah, so a small little shove, and the ball rolls down to the attractor of doom. Oh, and for the record, uh, public health organizations actually use models like this to not predict, but plan the, and like combat epidemics in real time, a feedback loop. They don't do it in emoji, but you know, they do use models. <laughs> but yeah, it's really hard to make things right, and it's really easy to break stuff. Are we condemned to just be like Sisyphus? Just keep pushing the boulder up the hill and wait for it to fall back down to do it all over again? 
Well, only if we think like Sisyphus. Only if we think that moving the boulder is our only option. The real moral of this story is, don't just move the ball, move the hills. <laughs> Which sounds ridiculous, but if you hear me out. Uh, so in the short term, it sounds that moving the hills will be a lot less effective, right? Um, yeah, you move the hills, and you change the hills slowly, but it still seems that the ball's trapped in the same valley. You move it again, and the ball seems, still seems to be trapped in the same valley. But one day, you change the hills just enough, and now with a very small nudge, boom, you can get it to where you wanted to get it in the first place. And so not only is it now a lot easier to nudge it to the next valley, it's also a lot more stable. Remember, up down is unstable, stable. And so the deeper the valley is, the more stable that system is in its new place. And how do you change the hills? You do so by fighting loops with loops. You can strengthen or weaken reinforcing or balancing loops. Two different actions on two different kinds of loops, that's four different strategies. So you can strengthen a reinforcing loop to uh, make a mountain taller. You can strengthen a balancing loop to deepen a valley. You can weaken a reinforcing loop to make a mountain shorter, and you can weaken a balancing loop to make a, val uh, a valley shallower. And remember, again, valleys are attractors, so you can weaken or strengthen attractors at different points to guide the ball, the system, into the place you want to go. Increase the stuff that you do value, maintain the stuff that you also value, and vice versa for the stuff you don't want. There are multiple valleys in all these examples I've given. Uh, Peter T. Coleman, a complexity scientist who applies systems to uh, peace building, uh, has said something really interesting. In his book, The 5%, uh, he knows that policymakers usually see peace as the absence of war. That is, they, they, they mostly try to reduce conflict and assume that that's equivalent to peace. But that's linear thinking. And these diagrams show us that that's not enough. That even if you make the war valley shallower, that's still not enough, because you also need to deepen the peace valley, or create an entirely new valley where there wasn't one before. Create a new attractor. Because peace is not the mere absence of war. Health is not the mere absence of disease. Success is not the mere absence of disaster. A mountain is not the mere absence of a valley. Let's have a story that's not depressing for once. <laughs> Sometime in the O 1970s, Thomas Schelling, a political game theorist, uh, he was sitting in an airplane flying above his hometown, New York City. And from far above, Tom started thinking about a huge problem that exists, not just in New York City, but also here in SF and really all the major American cities, which is this. We are very divided by race. So here's the, uh, a visualization from the New York Times. Um, dots of a different color represent different races, as reported in the US Census. And this is how it is like a few years ago. And imagine it must have been much worse in Thomas Schelling's time. So why is this? The most common answer, and a partially correct and important answer, is that it's a lot of top-down stuff. Redlining, public housing policy, zoning, etc. But what about the stuff that's not top-down? Like white flight or immigrant enclaves. Nobody had a theory for how that could happen yet until Tom got an idea. Like Elizabeth McGee, 70 years before, he would simulate this complex system as a board game. So imagine this old nerd making a board game on your flight. That's Thomas Schelling. So this game is a one-player game, and it's called Segregation Solitaire. Really catchy name. <laughs> So step one is you pull out your, a checkerboard or you draw your own checkerboard. Mm. And step two, put down some pennies and dimes. Uh, the pennies and dimes will represent different races, and the checkerboard represents a city grid, with each square being a house or a place where you can live. So to start your game, uh, place a bunch of pennies and dimes randomly, uh, make them well mixed, but leave a few gaps for you know, leave a few empty spots so they can move, so they can move later. 
note how this actually starts off really integrated. Every coin has a coin of a different type as its neighbor. And now, how do you play this game? What's the rule? So there's only one rule. And so it's this. Each coin thinks to itself, I'll move if less than a third of my neighbors are like me. These are pretty tolerant coins. Oh, I can't hate pennies. Some of my best friends are pennies. <laughs> I love dimes. They have such an exotic culture. <laughs> so yeah, these are relatively tolerant coins. If they, they're only upset if less of, than a third of the neighbors are like them, which means that every one of them is actually OK being a little bit in the minority. So even though this is a pretty tolerant rule on the individual level, level how does this play, off, play out in the full game? So let's play the game step by step. First, you have to look for coins who are, ha who are unhappy. So here we've got two dimes, uh, one unhappy, one happy. The top dime is unhappy because only one out of five of its nearby neighbors are like it. And the bottom one is happy because two of uh, its five neighbors are like it. The first one, that's less than a third of its neighbors. So we move unhappy coins to a random spot. Uh, the important thing is that you don't think about this in advance. You just move it to a, any random empty spot. But now this causes a cascade, because this coin is now unhappy. Now only one out of four of its neighbors are like it. So it moves to a random empty spot. And this happens to pennies as well. And this keeps happening and happening and happening. Et voila. <laughs> and now our coin society is totally divided from the bottom up. So even though every coin was pretty tolerant on the individual level, on the collective level, we get a completely divided and segregated society. And this happens every time you play this game. Uh, it's an attractor state. It attracts it to this kind of separation, this division. And today we're just, so Tom created this as a cautionary tale. And today we're separated, we're still separated by ethnicity and race but also by ideology. Uh, Billy Bishop um, wrote a book recently called The Big Sort, which argued that a lot, of, a lot of the political polarization we're seeing recently has been driven by exactly this bottom-up mechanism. People are migrating to places, towns, cities, that are more ideologically like themselves, and so that's uh, creating a reinforcing loop of polarization. Anyway, Thomas Schelling chased this idea for the next couple of decades, and he won the Nobel Prize. Happy ending for him. <laughs> for the rest of us, we still got to deal with it. Oh, by the way, if you want to you know, not have to pull out coins and mentally calculate fractions in your head, uh, you can play uh, this game that I made with Weihart. It's called, uh, it's an adaptation of Schelling's segregation solitaire called Parable of the Polygons. So yeah, instead of pennies and dimes, you have triangles and squares. And just like how Elizabeth McGee extended the landlord's game with a solution called prosperity, uh, we've extended Schelling's game. Uh, so Schelling created, showed us the problem, and we extended it with the solution, how to reverse segregation, how to create diversity from the bottom up, which I won't tell you about. You have to play the game to see it. <laughs> When a whole bunch of individual parts, which are simple, but snap together to create a completely unexpected whole, that is called emergence, which is jargon and words are terrible. So usually people describe this by saying, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, this is a quote from Gestalt psychologist Kurt Kafka. Uh, this phrase is actually a mistranslation of what Kafka was trying to say. The phrase is better translated as, the whole is other than the sum of its parts. Emergence is everywhere. In our culture, economics, politics, any human endeavor, we are capable of both the wisdom of the crowds and the madness of the crowds. And the line between them is dangerously thin. And it's not just humans. Emergence is also found in all of nature. We've got water molecules that form snowflakes, termites that build complex architectures, and ants that create and act out a really efficient search algorithm for food. I feel like what the most beautiful 
and powerful reason to understand its emergence is, is what biologist E.O. Wilson called consilience. The idea that we can unify not just all the sciences, but also the arts and humanities. So here we've got physics that emerges into chemistry, that emerges into biology, that emerges into psychology, that emerges into sociology, economics, politics, history, and technology. So emergence, I feel like, is our best contender for what could really unify the arts and sciences and everything we care about. Now, emergence is not going to be a theory of everything, but it could be a theory of everything in between. <laughs> so what? I just gave you a very vague word for a very vague pattern that exists in some systems. So let's get on the brass tacks. What, 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 what are the actual elements of emergence? What are the specifics here? How, did it, how does it work? So to understand the elements, I would like to visit an example from one of my most cherished childhood memories. I was 12 or 13, small, really <laughs> small. And I was living in Vancouver at the time, uh, and we were near the water. I, I don't remember why we were there, but I remember what we found. Starlings. Oh, you love starlings as well. <laughs> Tens of thousands of them. They're beautiful and really creepy. <laughs> They're like a silent, shape-shifting, Lovecraftian sky beast, some form of alien intelligence that you just feel that just gazing upon it, that your mind's going to unravel. But in a good way, because it's really beautiful. Because <laughs> these starlings also present a mystery. There's no boss starling organizing, choreographing all this stuff. So how do they put forth this stunning collective dance? Nobody knows. But in 1986, uh, the now leading theory uh, was put forth by a computer scientist, Craig Reynolds. Craig Reynolds made a simulation called Boyds, which is how New Yorkers say birds. <laughs> Boyds. Here's a more modern re-implementation of his program. Uh, as you can see, it produces some pretty lifelike behavior, even in 2D. Um, and what's even more impressive is that the algorithm is incredibly simple. There's just three simple rules. And they are, rule number one, align your direction with other nearby voids. So pretend these chairs are voids. I'm here. They're all facing this way, so I align myself this way. Rule number two is move towards the other voids. So pretend those are voids. I'm here. Oh, hey, you're over there. I'll move over there. Oh yeah, there's a clicker. I forgot there's a clicker. I can actually move. <laughs> so move towards other boids unless... Rule number three, I'm too close to the boids. And so rule number three tells me to get the way, <laughs> to avoid crashing into other birds. Also note that rule number one is actually a reinforcing loop, because uh, aligning one boid creates more alignment, which forces the other nearby boids to align as well. And the other two rules are actually a balancing loop, because it gets me towards an equilibrium between, uh, how close to, between too close and too far. It's a balancing loop. So that's it. Those are the three simple rules that create these majestic flocks of starlings from the bottom up. But if you want even more lively behavior, you need a little pinch of chaos. <laughs> so starlings flock for the same reason that gazelle move in herds, or fish school in sc schools, yeah. <laughs> to throw off predators. Uh, and so yes, starlings only do these majestic dances only when there is a predator, like a hawk. That's my best hawk. That's what you're going to get. <laughs> in any case, you need a source of chaos. But also, you need a lot of starlings, because two starlings is not a flock. You need tens of thousands. You need a dense network of interactions. So finally, here it is, what this entire talk has been building up to. The elements of emergence. Reinforcing loops, balancing loops, chaos, and a dense network of interactions. So if you want to create a map that can help guide you through a complex emergent system, the parts of your map, your drawing tools, 
are these four elements, and these are the elements you should look out for. Reinforcing loops, balancing loops, chaos, network of interactions. And we could actually simplify this a lot, uh, a lot further. You could say that reinforcing and balancing loops are actually selection, because they force the ball to roll smoothly into a valley, an attractor, while the other two elements, chaos and interactions, create a variation. Chaos is like a ball that is just really <laughs> yeah, chaotic like that. And interactions are like a whole lot of balls just smashing against each other. So that creates a lot of variation. So variation and selection. Or in other words, evolution. Evolution requires a really fine balance between variation and selection. You have too much variation, and that's just random noise. You're not going to get anything useful. But here's something that I truly believe, that um, in terms of our culture and our cultural evolution, we are putting way too much focus on selection. You know, create incentives for the things you want, create sanctions for the things you don't want, nudge, nudge this, nudge that, optimize. And that's fine, but one, if you do too much selection, you can get trapped in, the, in a short-term solution. Or the jargon in evolutionary biology is local, maxima, something like that. And besides, we're also neglecting the whole other half of evolution, variation. So if you work in environmental issues, you know that a healthy ecosystem needs biodiversity. So it stands that a healthy human society also needs diversity. Yes, diversity in gender, race, capital D, diversity. That's important. But also diversity in ideas, beliefs, backgrounds, skills, solutions, and so on and so forth. And so here's some tips about how we can increase the variation, the chaos and interactions in our own society. Instead of implementing one top-down solution, we could uh, invite multiple competing solutions from the bottom up. Instead of separating out people out into different specializations, we could invite serendipity by allowing people to, across fields to interact. And instead of asking people to increase productivity, uh, let them also increase play to do stuff that's completely useless. Because stuff that's useless is random, and stuff that's random is variation, and variation is the real source of our evolution. So, how do you design evolution? The answer is you don't. That's crazy totalitarian talk. Don't do that. <laughs> what you can do is design for evolution. So that, one, respects people's own autonomy, because it's bottom up. And two, by designing for evolution, but not designing evolution, the system itself can surprise you with solutions that you never even thought of. In fact, evolution is such a good engineer that even our human engineers are copying evolution. There's uh, rocket nozzles and antenna that is designed with these things called genetic algorithms, which simulate evolution, but for antenna and rocket nozzles. And it makes much better solutions than humans could come up with alone. So the whole time we've been thinking of chaos as an enemy, a dragon to slay. But maybe, just maybe, we can make chaos our friend. <laughs> Think about chaos like fuel. <laughs> if you're not careful, thank you for getting a reference. <laughs> chaos is fuel. If you're not careful, it could set everything on fire. But if we're clever and we're careful, <laughs> chaos can be what drives us all forward. And one of my favorite quotes that comes from, uh, actually used to it, um, <laughs> is this. Evolutionary design is healthier than visionary design. Evolution, greater sign, revolution. Evolution over revolution. Because top-down solutions usually go the way of our British colonialists and their cobra bounty. But bottom-up solutions, where the whole is other than the sum of its parts, those are messy, chaotic, completely unpredictable, and the most beautiful things that our universe has to offer. So 
So it turns out that maps didn't actually say here be dragons. Uh, it turns out only two historical maps have done so, and one of them is the Hunt Lennox Globe, which was created in the year 01510. And it's a beautiful piece of work. It's a small, hollow copper sphere. It's four and a half inches wide. And imagine, like, this is 1510. No one has seen a photo of the entire Earth. And at this point, you could cut the whole world in your hands. And this globe, the map of it, was completely wrong. It was hilariously wrong. <laughs> Africa is like shriveled up like you in a bath. <laughs> Asia's stretched out like Laffy Taffy. Where's North America? It's just not there. <laughs> but as much as we can laugh about this map, um, keep in mind, our own maps, <laughs> not of geography, but of the complex systems that actually affect and impact real people, millions of people. Our maps of those systems are not much better. But we got to start somewhere. And it starts with a pen and a piece of paper. So in this talk, in, wow, 50 minutes already, I've given you three tools, tools to map systems, loops, attractors, and emergence. And with these tools, you can see and play with systems, drawing, just playing around, doodling. And these tools are just scratching the surface. There are dozens of other visual tools like this, stock and flow diagrams, two-dimensional attractors, evolutionary fitness landscapes, and so on. But these three <laughs> capture the core ideas of systems. And these core ideas will be our map. And again, a map shows us, yes, what we do know, and shows us what we don't know. But most importantly, they exist to guide us. So here's my personal guide for how we can tackle complex systems together. One, fight loops with loops. Two, change the hills. And three, make chaos your friend. So now that we have these tools, our maps, and our guide, can we finally slay the dragon of complexity? the dragon of chaos? And the answer, my friends, is a very confident... <laughs> <laughs> but here's something else we can do. We can see the dragon, honestly, truly. Get out, out of our old linear mindsets and honestly understand, see, this dragon for who it really is. And then we can play with the dragon. We'll have to interact with the dragon no matter what. But we need to consciously decide what kind of game we're playing. Are we playing Monopoly or Prosperity? And we can deepen that feedback loop between us, humanity, and the complex systems that shape our lives, the dragon. And although we will never be the dragon's master, neither does the dragon have to be our master. We can make chaos our friend. And together, as a whole, we can be other than the sum of our parts. Thank you. That was great. Thank you. Way to go. Thank um, you. <laughs> you mentioned in passing toward the end there fitness landscapes. Uh, mm. You want to say a little bit about how, because evolution is sort of what you got to, there. and what are fitness landscapes? Ah, so fitness landscapes, they're similar to the ball and hill uh, examples I showed earlier, but all right, imagine, all right, let me get the ball. <laughs> Imagine we have a landscape, this chair. Um, so a fitness landscape, so instead of, so in, our early, in my early example, uh, the ball fell down towards the valleys, but in fitness landscapes, the ball is alive and it's trying to get up, it's kind of trying to crawl up the hill. However, it doesn't have eyes, so it can't see very far. Mm -hmm. So even though it may crawl up a hill and it realizes, and it thinks, oh, I'm at the top, so therefore I'm at the very top, but it can't see very far, so it might miss out on a bigger hill. 
like me. Uh, so that's an evolutionary fitness landscape, and it, I guess it functions effectively the same as attractors. Mm -hmm. It's just you know, flipped upside down. Um, and actually a lot of like evolutionary mathematical, um, yeah, mathematical biolo bi biologists do use uh, two-dimensional attractor mm -hmm. diagrams to show how uh, things evolve over time. So the, as I recall, one of the sort of lessons of fitness landscapes, because the ball doesn't have eyes, is it, it's sort of yes. trudging up the local hill and it doesn't see the fabulous mountain over here. And just behaving locally and without eyes, how can it get from that local <laughs> maxima to have a try at what might be a higher hill? How does that work? Variation. Variation. Say more. Yeah. So if a ball, and this, well, this, I guess this is less true for, no, and this might be true for biological evolution as well, but I'll start with um, how some evolution-inspired algorithms. Uh, so I'm going to use, I'm going to try to avoid jargon. <laughs> um, yeah, so as you mentioned, there is like the problem where a ball can get stuck up a local hill but not know about its global hills, mm -hmm. uh, the global taller hills like me. Um, and so one thing you can do, so it, only, it will get stuck only if it believes that, uh, only if the ball only goes up hills. Mm -hmm. But if you have some variation, some chaos, and allow the ball to move down hills, um, if you allow a lot of variation, so like this ball moves a little bit down, and a bit of chaos asks it to go all the way down, and it even moves even further up, if the ball's really lucky, it can finally find a place that's actually taller than the previous hill, and then it can start climbing up to a bigger uh, global optimum, a, a, a bigger hill. So yeah. you're using chaos to give luck a chance. The what? You're using chaos to give luck a chance. Yes. Of course, you're also giving bad luck a chance when you do that. That's true. <laughs> so the, so yeah, that, that's why species go extinct. Sucks for them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, variation actually is a big explanation for why, so here's an evolutionary puzzle. Why, why does sex exist? Because if you think about it, it's pretty costly to have half your offspring not be able to reproduce on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, so so the, the leading hypothesis right now is that you know, if it allows for a lot more variation. You can vary 50% of your offspring's genes. Mm -hmm. um, imagine if 50% of your genes right now were randomly mutated. Uh, that would not be very good for you. So mutation alone, uh, John Holland uh, mm -hmm. actually proved that evolution by mutation alone could not work. Right. Uh, you need recombination, yep. which is why uh, this is the leading hypothesis for why sex exists, even though it's so costly, is mm -hmm. that that extra variation, which is the source of evolution and adaptation, is so advantageous that mm -hmm. it's worth making half your offspring be unable to create a new mm -hmm. offspring mm -hmm. by itself. Yeah, sexual selection, supposedly um, sexual reproduction came along when uh, parasites came along. Yeah. And so uh, parasites reproduce really rapidly, so organisms were kind of going along and just you know, basically cloning. And then the parasites could always beat them. They couldn't evolve faster than the parasites unless they figured out the chaotic workaround, which was sex. Right. Sex is pretty chaotic. <laughs> <laughs> it's San Francisco. I can make this joke. <laughs> San Francisco is an attractor. <laughs> sure is. Noah asks, in your game of trust explanation, you sometimes show things concretely animating each move, and sometimes abstractly graphing an entire tournament. How do you decide between when to be concrete and when to show abstraction? I was really inspired uh, by this interactive essay by Brett Victor, um, who is called Up and Down the Ev <laughs> Up and Down the Ladder of Abstraction. Hmm. Uh, and so his essay starts off really concretely, mm -hmm. and then it steps one level above the it goes one level up in abstraction, and it goes another level up in abstraction, and so on and so forth. So so that's the kind of pattern that I've been using in all of my uh, interactive simulations and games, is starting off super concrete and then building uh, up the abstractions. 
But as I mentioned earlier, like, the understanding does not come from going higher and higher in abstractions. I guess like, it's better to think of it rather than going up the ladder of abstraction. Every time you pull on a rung, you're actually bringing the entire ladder down. <laughs> go back a minute. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. Dave? We're getting there. Um, go back to that complex uh, diagram the military guy was showing. If we understand the diagram, we'll win the war. <laughs> and, um, and so say that set of generals uh, brings you in to help them understand what's going on in a complex situation like, say, Syria. Uh, <laughs> and you get your security clearance, and you're in the building, and they're showing all these various things interacting. And uh, what are, how are you going to help them do something more actionable and understandable than the diagram that defeated mm -hmm. them? Uh, okay, first of all, I'm not going to be able to solve Syria in like the two minutes I'm answering this question up here. <laughs> uh, of course, but you know, <laughs> would you be getting them into how do you move the hill? Uh, mm -hmm. How do you look for what are the right. uh, reinforcing loops that mm -hmm. are making a good thing happen that you can make stronger? Is that sort of the approach you'd take yeah, with them? Yeah, I would feel like, yeah, if I were to apply the three, <coughs> sorry, chaotic ball, uh, the three lessons uh, from this talk, fight mm -hmm. loops with loops, mm -hmm change the hills, mm -hmm. and make chaos your friend. Uh, okay, uh, yeah, again, would Syria, like, say, chaos is not always good. Down chaos, chaos. Is, <laughs> yeah, chaos is not always good. Uh, I guess, yeah, a better way to say chaos is variation. Okay, um, and well, so that's interesting, yeah. I would say, uh, so working, you know, say, okay, let's start with the whole variation and selection mm -hmm. thing first. That's like the guide number three. Uh, I, would, I think that a lot of the solutions in Syria have been very top-down, and that's, a lot of the solutions in a lot of the peacemaking community has been very mm -hmm. top down. And I feel like it would be very beneficial to um, try more bottom up solutions, like get the <coughs> local community, like have the local community drive more of the efforts, which I know is a lot easier said than done. Mm -hmm. So again, I'm not solving this right here. But uh, if I were to apply what I just talked about um, to conflicts like uh, Syria, mm -hmm. um, that's how, what I would recommend. So one local community story you tell in your business surrounding the, uh, the Prisoner's Dilemma game that you developed mm -hmm. is uh, the Christmas truce that happened in World yes. War I. You want to say what happened and why that was interesting? Hmm. So uh, for just background, so the Christmas truce, in the year 1914, uh, sorry, the year 01914, oh, we're, we're in the long now, <laughs> put the O's up front. It was World War I, and at the Western Front, uh, the battles between the German and British trenches, on Christmas, everyone, in a lot of the trenches, not all of them, but in a lot of them, soldiers on both sides of the trenches put down their guns, got out of the trenches, walked across no man's land, and celebrated Christmas together. They buried their dead, they sang songs, and they exchanged gifts. And so the really like, amazing thing about this Christmas truce is that it was actually not unique. They already had a truce, very unofficial truces, long before uh, Christmas. Hmm. Um, so they had something called the live and let live system that emerged from the bottom up spontaneously uh, across many of, all, a lot of the trenches. Hmm. In fact, it, the, the top down, um, the officers were explicitly trying to prevent this. Hmm. Um, they would Order the soldiers, all right, you have to shoot them. Um, so the live in that system is, you know, you don't kill me, I don't kill you. Um, so even when the, so this is, I really like the story, even when the officers were directly ordering the soldiers to fire their weapons, the soldiers would fire the weapons at very precise targets at the exact times on every day right. so that each other, each army could learn each other's patterns and even though they would be shooting, they would both live. And so, um, if you play my game, The Evolution of Trust, uh, it's an explanation of how this trust can emerge from the bottom up mm -hmm. uh, using uh, Robert Axelrod's game theory of the iterated prisoner's dilemma. And the whole business there, as I recall, is it, it's solved by iterated uh, prisoners. So if people keep playing it, they uh, basically catch on to the thing that the troops figured out that you could yeah. do a workaround and pretend to be having your war, but actually nobody gets killed. 
Yes, that's, that's why trench warfare is mm -hmm. unique in a, amongst like all kinds of warfare. Because unlike most kinds of warfare, you will most likely not see, see the same specific enemy soldiers right. twice. If you have, you have not done your job. <laughs> uh, but with trench warfare, you will s encounter and face off the same specific soldiers over and over again. Uh, mm. Being the same specific soldiers is incredibly important. If it's just the same general flag or enemy, mm. then this does not work. Uh, but if it's the same specific individuals, then um, that's an iterated prisoner's dilemma. And in that case, uh, cooperation can evolve. So that's another version of local. It's not just, they're not abstract, they are specific. Mm -hmm, yeah. And specific gives you that chance to do the workaround. So Kevin Kelly asks, can your insights be used not just to understand whole systems, but to build them, uh, like mm -hmm. IAs, AIs, like robots, so like artificial life, which copies right. some of these things. I like how you accidentally misspoke and said IA, because IA is actually amazing. Say more. So AI, artificial, it's an artificial, I can't even say it today. Words are terrible. AI is artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. IA is intelligence amplification. Okay. And I think a few decades ago, there was this like, big debate about AI versus mm -hmm. IA. Uh, and the work I do, I feel like, is more aligned with IA. Mm -hmm. It doesn't, at least the philosophy of, it seems like the philosophy of AI right now is to replace human thinking, or at least parts of human thinking. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but IA augments and amplifies mm -hmm. our human capabilities. So, as I mentioned, the way we advance is not by floating up an abstract land, it's by getting amazing abilities and bringing it down to our human level. So mm -hmm. I just like showed off a lot of complex and really chaotic systems, mm -hmm. and it was all done with human capabilities of drawing and seeing, and that, human, that very unique human capability mm -hmm. of play. And so, it doesn't try to replace those human capabilities, it augments them by, <coughs> I think I, I'm choking on some cork dust, I've been playing with that so much. More water. Yeah. <coughs> so the, uh, while he's drinking, I'll, it's kind of a book plug here, this is uh, John Markov's book, Machines of Loving Grace, where hmm. he basically spelled out the history, of the, the, the history of that argument between AI and IA. And uh, not surprisingly, he comes down on the uh, augmenting in intelligence, which was sort of the Doug Engelbart, mother of all demos uh, kind of thing. Right. Work with the human as the, uh, as the thing to yeah. augment. Uh, and anyway, to answer your question, uh, Kevin, uh, yes. Um, so the emoji simulation, uh, I didn't show it, but it is programmable. Uh, and it's programmable through English. Uh, you, you select the sentences you want, and all the code is in plain... Uh, English, and also Loopy, you can program it by drawing. Mm -hmm. So right now, those are the only tool, two tools I've made so far, mm -hmm. but the nice thing about a pen and paper is that that's all the tools you really need to understand systems deeply. I feel like one weakness in my work that I want to you know, work on is that it's really hard to make an interactive, and if mm. I were to like, like, it's really hard yeah, for someone else to make an interactive, because mm -hmm. code is just still stuck from 40 years ago. But with a pen and paper, you can do that. You can draw your own systems mm -hmm. tomorrow or tonight if you want. So you made Loopy recently in this dynamic. You made uh, the Prisoner's <laughs> Dilemma game, this dynamic. Um, yeah. What's the next interesting problem that you would like to Ooh. solve that way? Uh, I don't know about solving, but... <clears throat> Explaining, you know, mm -hmm. okay. knowing is half the battle. Yeah, make visible. What, <laughs> yeah. yeah. What, what tool would you like to develop? Um, I really want to talk more and like show more about human cooperation. Because uh, I feel like that's a really important theme, especially right now, but also, you know, in general. Um, okay, I'm going to go into the jargon here, but I want to explain stuff like Eleanor Ostrom's uh, mm -hmm. governance of the commons, how people mm -hmm. govern commons from the bottom up. Uh, so, the, so the traditional story is that, you know, tragedy of the commons, rational mm -hmm. people will mess up the commons entirely unless they have a central authority or it's privatized. Mm -hmm. uh, but Eleanor Ostrom has shown empirically mm -hmm. and theoretically that, uh, yes, people can and do manage the commons from the bottom up. And that's definitely very, very important today, not just with environmental issues, but also commons like democracy or norms or culture or economics. 
So some of the sort of rules that she oh, she, thank you. she inferred by uh, seeing these systems, fishing systems and water providing systems and so mm -hmm. on, that were self um, self managing in a healthy way over the long term. Uh, there were things like uh, they needed sort of a boundary, yeah, and, and they needed things like that. Um, there were rules that everybody basically had to understand and agree on, but there were also rules about changing the rules so that they could uh, improve mm -hmm. the system, whether well, it's this infinite game kind of stuff, which would be another great project for you. Um, Thank you. I'll make a note of that. The infinite game. Boy, That's you do plan. that one or we can all relax. Infinite game. And this uh, actually comes to, to a, a question that Kevin Kelly raises. Long Now Foundation, Long Now is the last 10,000 years that we can draw on mm -hmm. the next 10,000 years that we feel sort of responsible for. And how does the kind of tools that you're making clear help that process of basically long-term thinking, long-term acting, long-term responsibility, long-term embracing? Um, I mean, in a way, the vicious cycle you showed at the very beginning was the thing that goes faster and faster and faster until it breaks. Right? Yes. And uh, what are what emerges from what you've got already, or from what you might have help us get uh, that would encourage this kind of long frame <clears throat> to activity? Right. So I'm not sure if this contradicts some of the long now members, but as I oh, mentioned, good. I'm both. Prediction is for chumps. Right. So you cannot predict, mm -hmm. you know, the future. Uh, yeah, we, like 20 years ago, people didn't, like, well, 50 years ago, people predicted flying cars and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. But no one predicted, you know, the internet or smartphones. And also, for the record, flying cars, th those are called helicopters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, if you can't even predict 50 years in the future, and technology is only accelerating, how will we predict anything 10,000 years in the future? So what I was proposing instead in my Long Now talk mm -hmm. is not to predict the future, but create strategies for the future. I feel like people really conflate the words planning and predicting. Mm -hmm. I feel like they are com two completely different things. Uh, so yeah, you can plan for evolution, mm -hmm. which is, sounds paradoxical because evolution is all about stuff that surprises you mm -hmm. and there is no foresight in evolution. Mm -hmm. um, but you can plan for it. You can create uh, decentralized systems to allow for variation. Mm -hmm. You can allow people across fields to interact, which you know, creates more creativity. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like, and I feel like this, that, that strategy of variation and selection and thinking about feedback loops and changing the attractors. I feel like that could last 10,000 years because it's worked for the last 3.5 billion years of our evolution. So mm -hmm. it should work, hopefully. So one of the things which has emerged in um, control theory mm -hmm. is that uh, if you respond too quickly to a stimulus, you can get into a, just a total vicious yeah. cycle. And, but if you build in a delay, and they're trying to do this with uh, things in the stock market, for example, because it got so fast that it right, could crash in various directions and the cascade gets going. And so, you know, what's the, how would you explain how that sort of delayed response process mm -hmm. works? Yeah, that's what I mentioned in the changing the hills section. Mm -hmm. okay. So we have the stock market, uh, that is a mountain because it's a reinforcing mm -hmm. loop. Uh, and thanks to technology that lets, well, robots, not even stockbrokers, robots trade stocks at milliseconds, uh, cascades can jump from robot to robot mm -hmm. immediately. So this, this mountain is now, well, it's just a big, long mountain, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so if you wanted to, and you know, having an incredibly long mountain, if you fall off the top, that's really bad. Mm -hmm. So... Changing the hills, uh, adding those delays would be the equivalent of weakening those reinforcing loops, mm -hmm. which is the equivalent of making that mountain right. shorter, you mm -hmm. know, more human scale. So if you fall off, you probably don't break everything. Mm -hmm. I like it. Um, Gerald Harris yeah. asks. Yeah. Here's the ball. Mountain. Dead. <laughs> no, up, 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 up. Give me that ball. <laughs> Not for you. <laughs> that answers the question Sorry. that... Um, <laughs> 
Molly asked, are there examples of negative, negative loops that would result in extinction of either or both actors? Um, uh, sorry, what? Negative, negative, negative loops. Is that the same as positive, positive? I wonder what's the negative. Uh, negative that, that is actually, yes, the equivalent of a positive feedback loop because mm -hmm. you have to multiply the, you know, yeah, it, so if you have less, all right, so A, B, minus, minus. Mm -hmm. Less of A causes more, sorry, more of A causes less of B, but because it's flipped around, mm -hmm. less of B causes more of A, which mm -hmm. causes less of B, which causes more of A, which causes less of B, more and more of A. Okay, that's, so a, that's it, a cl classic negative feedback loop. She's suggesting uh, no, that a, is negative, a negative, that, negative. Uh, that is a positive feedback loop. No, if you have up, bless up, bless negative, up, bless negative, bless negative mm -hmm. double negatives are a positive. Right. That's what I said. So that is how extinction <laughs> occurs. <laughs> right. What was the question? <laughs> uh, better question. Oh. Gerald Harris. Aww. <laughs> Sorry, Molly. Well, that was, you know, that was uh, Molly's was uh, is the negative negative uh, lead to oh, extinction. And the answer is it does. Positive feedback yeah, can lead to can. extinction. That's what can. happened to the ball just now. Uh, my favorite. Well, not favorite, but I guess my most. I trying to think. What's a good negative negative loop? Um, okay, personal example, or at least my favorite, no, not first, yeah, okay, personal example. Motivation and depression, okay, <laughs> here we go. It's a negative, negative loop. More motivation means less depression, supposedly, and more depression means less motivation. So it is a vicious cycle, it is a positive feedback loop. Again, I, yeah, reinforcing loop is the mm. best, words are terrible. It's a reinforcing loop because mm -hmm. if you're more depressed, that means less motivation, but less mm -hmm. motivation means you're more depressed, which means less motivation, more depressed. It's a vicious cycle. It's a reinforcing loop. So there, there we go. That's a concrete example of how a negative, negative loop can be a reinforcing uh, cycle. There you go. Um, Gerald Harris asks, a piece of music is a system. Uh, listening, and uh, you pick up the system. Have you thought about mapping music? Mm. Or have you thought about mapping with music? Ooh, Ooh mapping with right, music. Ooh, that's right, yeah. That's interesting. I'm, I guess the first thought that pops to mind is that you experience sound completely linearly. You know who would love to work on this would be Brian Eno, one of our other speakers. Actually, yeah, you're right. I, I shouldn't have said you experience sound linearly because Brian Eno. Um, you know what? I haven't thought about that. Uh, I guess the question, the answer, my answer to the question is answer. I have not thought about that. We'll try it. Maybe. Jam with Eno over there. We'll put you guys together and see what happens. Thank you yeah. for doing this. Thank this you so is great. Much. Thank you.